welcome to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I'm so excited that you're joining us today. We are going to have a fascinating conversation, as usual, as we learn from people all around the world at all ages and stages of life. Stay tuned as we shift our dementia care from crisis to comfort. Here we go. Don't you think about Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to Alzheimer Speaks. I'm thrilled you're going to join us today. We are going to be celebrating 25 years of supporting families and caregivers um, through the Normandale Center for Healing and Wholeness. We're going to hear their story today, and I'm really excited to um, be able to bring this to you. They're just doing great, great work here in the Twin Cities in Minnesota. We're not only going to hear from their executive director, but we are going to hear from their caregiver specialist and a care partner and then two people living with dementia as well and how their program has really assisted them. But before I introduce you to all of our guests today, I'd like to do a couple of shout outs. So, and one is to the organization called Twiddle. And if you haven't heard of them, they make really cool sensory aids that help people, especially during sundowning, how it can reduce the stress, not for just those living with dementia, but also their care partners. They also make a uh, clothing piece called Adaptive Wrap, where sometimes things can get real combative when we're trying to put something over the head. And this alleviates all of that. So go to their website, which is the number four and then twiddlesplural.com. I also want to shout out to Lorenzo's house because they are doing their annual youth summit, which is going to be held June 14th and 15th. It's free. So go to Lorenzo's house Dot org for more information. And of course, I always do a couple of support groups every month. One is virtual, the other is in person here in Shoreview. If you're interested in either of those, please reach out to me. And then um, two last things. I always encourage people to go visit Dementia Map, our global resource directory, and you are invited to participate in that. We are not going to be asked for any personal information unless, of course, you, you want to participate in being a resource and we need to have some information from you uh, to be able to connect you to others in need. And then also Alzheimer's Speaks. If you go to my main website, you will also find a bunch of free educational resources there. So with no further ado, let's go ahead and introduce you to our panel today. Well, I am so excited to have this conversation. It seems like we talked ages ago about getting this set up and the time has arrived. I am really excited about this show because this organization is really right in my backyard. And yet there's a lot I didn't know about it. So I know there's a lot that my listeners don't know either that we want to share. So um, I'm going to go to Jennifer first and just have everybody introduce themselves. And Jennifer, if you don't mind kicking us off, you know, mentioning the your company name and then a little bit about yourself. Sure. Thank you, Lori. Thanks for having us. I'm Jennifer Monroe. I'm the executive director of the Normandale Center for Healing and Wholeness. And we're a nonprofit that's been in existence for 25 years. We're 25th anniversary is next year. Um, and we provide educational programming and workshops, um, counseling and supportive services um, for caregivers. So the majority of the folks that we support are caring for somebody with Alzheimer's or related dementias. And so that's kind of our field of specialty. I have a personal connection in addition to my professional work of um, both my father and my um, uncle and my grandmother um, uh, had Alzheimer's. And I lost my dad seven years ago. Becky, how about you? Sure. Uh, my name is Becky Zinn Caulfield. I'm a social worker and caregiver specialist here at the Normandale Center. Um, I've been here just a couple of years, but um, have been a social worker for many years um, and have uh, really enjoyed working with um, the geriatric population. Um, and I do have a personal connection as well of both my grandmothers. 
um, an uncle, and now my mom has been diagnosed with uh, mild cognitive impairment. Okay, thanks for sharing that. Mm -hmm. And Lee, how about you? Do you want to introduce yourself? Well, I'm a longtime member of Normandale and just feel so blessed to be here with, at the center. Um, they certainly are meeting my needs. I um, was diagnosed with Parkinson's. <laughs> oh, you can tell I'm not used to doing this. My husband was diagnosed with Parkinson's many years ago. And um, now I have been diagnosed with dementia. It's... Um, it's sometimes it's very evident as was just the case and sometimes it isn't um i never quite know but i um i'm learning so much what's available i don't feel alone i feel i much support um i um uh, i can't say enough good about the normandale center um and um it's i'm very grateful for it and for the people here Great. Thank you. And Ken and Mary Margaret. Ken, do you want to go first and introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Ken Lehman. I'm 87 years old. And uh, I was diagnosed probably 13 or 14 years ago. And uh, I have all the biomarkers and everything that is associated with Alzheimer's. But for some reason, I have not declined. And so I have been studied by quite a few different doctors as to why I have all the biomarkers, but I have not declined. And they really don't know. So uh, I'm here to support other people uh, because I can. Wonderful. Thank you, Ken. So you are a unicorn out there. And that's wonderful. My own mom lived with dementia for 30 years. So... I understand how things can not progress or slowly, slowly progress um, over the years. And, and people kind of look at you sideways sometimes, like how, how, how can that happen to you and, and not to my loved ones? So I appreciate that you are willing to be studied and advocate for, for yourself and others. Mary Margaret, why don't you introduce yourself? I am Mary Margaret Lehman. I am a wife, a daughter, a, uh, a mother, a grandmother, a sister, a friend. I was a speech therapist. I was a reading consultant and a adjunct professor at UCLA teaching teachers how to teach reading. And I was just about to retire when I began to notice more and more changes in Ken on a day-by-day -day basis, um, he was having difficulty at work learning a new computer program. Uh, we were having some difficulty with our financial situation. And as a result, we started seeing doctors. And we actually saw nine doctors mm -hmm. in California and here in Minneapolis before Ken was finally diagnosed with Alzheimer's. He was nothing, he is nothing like my dad was, nor my uncle was, nor his dad, but um, he has his own unique diagnosis of Alzheimer's and it's been um, amazing, truly amazing to walk beside him and see him make a difference in others' lives as a result. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, it's so it's so nice to get people together that have these variety of, of stories and what they're doing, you know, with that information and, and how each of you has been touched. So I, I really appreciate you coming in as a panel to to have this discussion. Um, Jennifer, I'm going to go to you first. Do you want to share a little bit about the Normandale um, Center for Healing and Wholeness, and how did it get started, and how are you serving people with dementia? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, we were started through a coalition of a number of uh, large organizations in the Twin Cities, uh, including Fairview Health Services, Lutheran Brotherhood, and Lutheran Social Services. 
uh, but spearheaded through Normandale Lutheran Church. Um, and again, as I mentioned, it's about 24 years ago that this all happened. And we started as a ministry to support people in the community and then incorporated as a nonprofit in 2000. And since that time, I was thinking about how many people we've served, looking at prior numbers. And I think we've served 10,000 people in the past 24 years, served um, between 400 and 500 individuals a year. And again, caregivers that are supporting someone in their life, a spouse, a parent, a friend, a neighbor, informal, unpaid, you know, and family caregivers. And really the crux of what we do is um, bring people together. Uh, people share their stories and information and resources. One of our most popular services is our support groups. We have four support groups right now and a memory cafe. And they're just increasing just you know we have a drop in uh on the second saturday of every month and it's just growing We're seeing more and more people dropping in and just looking for that opportunity to talk about their experience and share with one another um, and so that's we do a number of group things related to that education support groups but we have social work services that provide individual and one-on-one -on -one family meetings a lot of educational workshops yeah. Um, and uh, we also offer respite, which is we started offering programming early on and people were having difficulty attending because they were, you know, caregiving as a 24 hour job. And um, it was difficult to find resources and, and adequate supports to care for the family member. And so we started um, utilizing volunteers and training them, putting them through our program and also a training program through the Alzheimer's Association to help provide respite so that caregivers could come in and participate in services, education or support groups. And then there would be a group of uh, with activities and um, led by a staff person, volunteer coordinators and volunteers to keep the family member engaged so that um, everybody is um, having an opportunity to share and learn from one another and hopefully have a positive experience and, and just all be together with, um, be able to say um, whatever, uh, people want to say and talk about what's going on in their lives. So I think that's that's one of the strongest things that we offer. And as far as more detail on social work services, Becky um, is our uh, specialist, and she um, could probably speak a little bit more about what she does with individuals and families regarding supportive services for that. Great. Becky, you want to tell us a little more? <laughs> sure. Um, so, uh, yeah, I meet with um, caregivers and or um, families, depending on what they feel is needed. Um, sometimes those referrals come through the Alzheimer's Association. Uh, a lot of them are word of mouth. Um, people learn from their friends uh, that we are here as a resource. And, uh, and as Jennifer said, we have uh, really been booming lately. Um, so, but I, uh, caregivers will come in and I'll have them complete a caregiver assessment. Um, and we sit down and talk through that and really look at their unique caregiving situation. Um, and we'll identify the areas that they feel they need some help in, which really can run the gamut, as you can imagine. Um, it could be um, anything from needing some in-home help to needing elder law services to uh, hiring a housekeeper to looking at assisted living facilities, uh, talking about advanced care planning. Uh, it, it really is all over the place. Um, so we work through their individual situation and um, set them up with resources and then provide uh, continuous follow-up um, as needed. Um, and we'll meet again as needed uh, to continue to support them along their journey. So um, and then I uh, oversee the um, support groups too. As Jennifer said, we have, um, we're starting a second um, support group on our second Saturdays because we have uh, overgrown um, our group. So um, I'm glad people are learning about us and coming out and getting the support that they need. Um, and then also started the Memory Cafe in December of last year. And that has been um, going really well and people have been um, contacting me, wanting to attend. It's been great to see that happen. So, Well, that's fantastic. As far as your support groups, are are they mostly couples or individuals or adult children with parents or great. is it a little bit of everybody? Yeah, great question. Um, we aren't um, 
splitting the groups by couple or spousal caregivers, et cetera, um, at this point in time. Uh, so it, it's all of the above. Uh, we have a large majority are spouse, um, and then probably adult children would be the next category. There are even some sibling caregivers uh, that come. So, yeah. And so many will come, of course, on their own. There are, so, you know, perhaps a parent caregiver or spousal caregiver where the adult children come with them. Um, and uh, and then, as Jennifer said, too, we have the respite so that um, otherwise some people wouldn't be able to attend at all. So, yeah, that's how I do my groups, too. I don't I don't break them apart because I think there's more overlap than not. Which sure. It's good to see everybody's situation because we can still learn from one. Absolutely. And the we have two virtual support groups. Those, um, based on the timings, uh, I would say a fair amount of those are maybe more adult children just because of the timing and perhaps they can't come as easily on a weekend, whereas the spousal um, caregivers are perhaps more available to come on the weekend. Okay. That's One thing I would say about the center that makes us unique as well is we... Um, all of our uh, revenue comes from grants and contributions, you know, individuals who do, we ask people who, you know, do want to contribute are certainly welcome, but there's no charge for anything that we offer. So um, primarily our goal is to provide supportive services for those who may not have somewhere else to go to participate in a support group or attend an evidence-based or educational class. And so that's unique as well. So we don't turn anybody away for inability to contribute or, or anything to any of our services. So. And that's so critical in this day and age, um, people are really struggling financially. And the last thing you want is to have that burden of, yes. uh, you know, where's your cash, you know, before you can learn or get connected and supported. Uh, I just think that that is, is a critical, critical piece. So thank you for for structuring you know all of your support services in that manner mm -hmm. um ken i want to go to you next if that's okay i want to know during covid um when we you know we were all kind of stuck in our houses and really weren't able to communicate how critical was it for you to still be able to connect in some fashion you've talked a lot about caregivers but no one has talked about giving service to the person that has Alzheimer's. And I think that is really needed. After COVID, there were many programs, or I should say before COVID, there were many programs for the person who has Alzheimer's and their loved one, whoever. And we would go to the arts center uh, and do things. We had the Northern Clay Center come and do things. We had a drum contest, uh, all these different things that were geared for the person with Alzheimer's. And I think one of the regrets is that uh, we're just getting put in a closet. Those people that are really need some other type of activity, uh, sitting around doing nothing, uh, does it really help uh, the brain in any way whatsoever? So I would like to see some support groups for just the person with Alzheimer's. I, I agree. I think that's a huge, huge need out there. And um, for me and my situation, I'll just put in my two cents with that is, you know, my mom lived with dementia for 30 years and I, I kind of stepped into this world as a disgruntled um, care partner to my mother and, and daughter going, where are all the services, products and tools, not just for us, but for especially people with dementia and why isn't their voice being heard? Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the things I love about this show is because people with dementia are more than welcome to join us um, on this show. We do open mic um, once a month, anybody can call in. And then we also have um, dementia chats where I interview people on a monthly basis and that's totally mm -hmm. virtual. And the panel of people living with dementia 
they decide the topic. I just record it and push it out, <laughs> you know, well, I because I think the the value in their voice and insights um, is is absolutely critical. We also have just started a art program, Dimension the Art, not where we teach art, but where we highlight people's art that are living with dementia. And so mm. those are available. And, you know, anybody can duplicate any of those things as well, because, you know, none of us can cover the need um, for the number of people. Um, this is a this is a global um, situation, and we need as many of us to work together. So thank you for bringing that point up. I, I think it's extremely important. There are a couple of organizations that focus just specifically on raising the voice of people with dementia. One is Dementia Action Alliance, um, mm -hmm. known as DAA, and you can reach them at DAA now. Um, the other group is Dementia Minds, and they do a lot of um, education from the uh, speaker's aspect of a person with dementia as well. Um, as does DAA, but there are so many organizations like, like Normandale and myself and others that are also supporting this and, and, you know, evolving as things come up. Um, mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that is wonderful, Ken, about what you said is that we need to, we need to reach out to people like you and Leaf that are living with dementia and hear your comments, because if you don't speak up and tell us those are a need, we may not figure that out. You know, we need to be directed. Um, you're living with it. You know it better than than anyone else there. So thank mm -hmm. you um, for, for stating that. Mary Margaret, I want to talk to you about COVID as well and how it kind of that, that shrinking social circle affected you and Ken, you know, living with dementia in your journey and living life as a whole. For sure. For sure, um, our I, I as you describe it, I just had this image of our little world becoming just very small during that period of time. I remember walking out on our deck, and our family would call and say, "We're driving by, wave." <laughs> so that would be a highlight of the day. But one of the most um, beautiful gifts that we experienced and I experienced as an onlooker. But our grandson asked Ken if they, if he and Ken could do genealogy together um, on Ken's family. And so they spent days, weeks, months, years actually, um, you know, researching all of the relatives that had come here and what a gift it, it has been for our grandson, particularly because he now has a very, very strong idea of who he is. And he is now 17 and feeling very sure of himself. He knows all about his family, his past and present. And that was such a gift for Ken to give to him. And Dr. Rosenblum is our neurologist. And Ken, I took the uh, the writings that Ken uh, did during that time to Dr. Rosenblum and showed them. And he also drew uh, pictures uh, and maps of where he lived as a child and where the farm was and what was on the farm and so forth. And so there was a visual attached to it as well. So our grandson really made a, a difference for us, to, for Ken particularly, for me, because my heart was full watching them do this together. But it was, um, it was very difficult because we had 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 quite a busy life and I don't know that since then it has really returned to the many activities that we had. And I about, um, oh gosh, Becky, was it about six months ago or so, I just began to really miss that connection. And I stopped by Normandale and I just felt as though I were home and I hadn't met Becky 
before, but I was immediately welcomed and felt um, at, at home and seen as well, because so many of us who were not allowed to go out uh, into the world because not only because of Alzheimer's, but because of other um, circumstances revolving around around the pandemic. Um, it was just, it was like coming home. I never have told you that, Becky, but it was just, it, it was uh, such a gift. And I've since re, um, re-upped my, my, um, involvement at Normandale and I was one of the 50 in a uh, wonderful support group meeting la a few Saturdays ago and it's just uh it's just it's home it's home where you can be yourself and it's a gift hmm. that's fantastic you know one of the things I don't think people understand the the strain um, dementia can put on families emotionally, physically, financially, the whole nine yards with that. Can you explain, you know, how that affected you as a family on all of those different levels, uh, Mary Margaret? Wow. Our, our story is our story, our life. <laughs> it isn't a story. It's real life. <laughs> is uh has been very challenging. Um, my brilliant, wonderful husband um, notified the rest of us in the family that he had something else going on when he declared that we would have to go through bankruptcy. And I realized that some of our bills were not being paid, but I didn't know why, because this has always been his area. And he, he's been in charge and he's done a fantastic job for years and years. We, in December, we will have been married 62 years. So it's, uh, it's something that I, we have expected and I've depended on but suddenly I was getting all kinds of notices that bills were not being paid, such as the garbage bill. And the reason was not, um, not something that I could accept, <laughs> but um, it was a very, very difficult time. And we had to go to federal court and we were deemed... Uh, to be in bankruptcy for 10 years. And just last year, we were received a notice that we were out of bankruptcy and we made it, we made it through, yes. So of course things have changed tremendously. We're on a, um, on a very small budget, but we are making it. And there are just so many things in life that can circumvent that sadness and that part of our being right now. And I think one of the things that we enjoy doing so much together is planting a garden on our deck. And we're coming up on, well, this is April, so we're coming up in just a couple of weeks of going over to Bachman's and, and starting our garden again, which is so such a life-giving experience and Ken takes he's just such an artistic um, eye and just does a beautiful job in planting and taking care of the garden until the winter early winter months so that's something to look forward to as well and one thing that we haven't talked about is the fact that he goes to woodworking every morning over at Edina High School they have a senior, old Edina High School. Old Edina, yes, yes, who needs to be stipulated. They have a, a, an old wood shop. And these fellows come from all around the and gals. Yeah, they come from all around Minnesota, air, uh, Minneapolis area, and they um, have a 
uh, a time to make anything they want. And Ken, in in uh, his purpose for making all of these beautiful, beautiful um, trays and what else would you call them? Trays. Bread box. Bread boxes. <laughs> yes, bread boxes. He then donates them to the Alzheimer's Association and they uh, um, auction them off at their gala in the in May so that uh, it, it brings in some extra um, um, money. Uh, yes, money, M-O-N-E-Y, money for the uh, um, association. So that gives him a lot of purpose. I think he's made something for you, Becky. He has, and I would show it, but I took it home. Uh, oh. But here's <laughs> an example. Um, that's a oh, yes. right of your artwork. Um, yes. So yeah. That's yeah. Similar to that's a card. We yeah. had cards made too of some of his woodworking. And right. so, so we're um, uh, able to share those in, in a different respect. Mm -hmm. But we, um, uh, we are just grateful. We have so much to be grateful for. And this is not the retirement that we expected, but you know, you just re-evaluate where our lives are and what we can do to be the best we can and to help one another and continue to help ourselves in this world that's so... What is this world, Abby? <laughs> It's an unpredictable world. <laughs> well, you know what amazes me is just your your outlook. And I'm sure it was hard not to go down the rabbit hole. I mean, when when dementia hits, when, you know, catastrophe happens, it's really easy to go down the rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. And and you may have done that for a while, but you've pulled yourself out and realized there are blessings and joyful moments every day if you choose to look for them. But you'll only find them when you're looking for them. And right. you know, even when you mentioned Becky, you know, just going over there and meeting with her just lifted your heart um, and you felt at home. Those are those are huge, huge things. And I think we have to help people look for the light and the good that's mm -hmm. around us, even during difficult times, um, because it is definitely there. I want to go uh, to Leaf next, um, because I'd like to hear from, from you, Leaf, on how did you cope with getting a, a dementia diagnosis? Um, I was suspicious um, of that because I usually had a very good memory. And um, what I did was... Um, talk about it, tell people, you know, I really don't think I'm remembering like I used to. Would you repeat that? I'd like to write that down. Um, I I just felt it was bad, better to admit it, acknowledge it, uh, at the same time being grateful for the memory I've had and memories I will still make. But I wanted others to know, instead of wondering whether or not she was um, remembering correctly or not. And uh, that has worked. And people are, are very responsive to that. If I tell them I have a memory that I'm not sure, would you repeat that? They're happy to do that. And I carry a pad of paper with me and a pencil and note things. And I will note that on my calendar. Calendars are wonderful, <laughs> whether daily or monthly or whatever. Um, and I just have a very empathetic family that is is, is very helpful. Um, I guess that's about it. I love that you were open about it because so many people hide it. You know, they're really fearful of will they still be accepted and what's going on. Um, but I, I think it's really smart to be able to do that. And I, and I know everybody's situation is different. Ken, for you, how did you deal with it when you got diagnosed or even prior? You said you were going to like nine different doctors. And it's not uncommon for a diagnosis to take, you know, two or three years to get for many people. 
did you share with others or did you not even notice yourself? Sometimes people themselves don't notice, but others around them do. You had a little hard time hearing you, um, but. Um, what was the question? So the bottom question is. I wanted to know if you notice uh, symptom changes within yourself and if you felt comfortable sharing those with others. I I don't uh, feel any stages. It just seems like I'm in a state of flux, but not going anywhere. <laughs> okay. Wonderful. Um, Mary Margaret, as a family, did you, did you, in, once you got the diagnosis, did you guys decide to tell family members and friends or um, I know you're doing advocacy now? Oh, yes. Yes. We, when we lost our home in California, we had moved in with our daughter and family and they were the ones who really um, encouraged us to get a diagnosis. So, um, uh, uh, yes, they were very much involved and helped us to realign our finances and so forth. So they were very involved and our son was also very involved and other fa everybody knows it's just no secret. I just don't like, um, not telling people because this is, this is our world now and there are definitely those who would prefer not to be um, too close. It might be contagious, but um, it's just a matter of, of we are who we are and we do the best we can. And we've, um, we just maneuver through life and just find our, our path that makes us feel whole and um and welcome when the opportunity is is there i don't hold back at all in fact i i have on a purple sweater today and um i often wear purple and i often get comments on the fact that i'm wearing purple and i'll say oh it's the alzheimer's co uh, color and they'll say oh and i always hear a story about someone in their family who has Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. So it's, it just opens the door and just makes it, it's just part of life it's just for many of us. And so it's nothing to be ashamed of. We are survi not only surviving, we are thriving. We are truly thriving. When Ken and I um, were first, when Ken was, Ken and I were first diagnosed. When Ken was diagnosed, uh, we had what we called the the five Ds. What were they, Lovey? Do you remember? No. <laughs> they were. We were depressed. We were. Let's see. Devastated. We were. We had all of these negative D words, and we we uh, just embraced them. And said, this is how we feel. Now, what are we going to do? And so we decided that we were going to make a difference. And that's why we became advocates. Because people didn't want to talk about it. They didn't want to talk about it with us. And we said, we have to bring this out of the darkness. So the more we talk about it, the more it's going to be accepted. Because it's just part of life for many of us. So... This is how we really be, decided to become advocates. And we've gone to Washington, D.C. three times and to different states and to the um, uh, legislature in Minneapolis, in St. Paul many times. And we're just we're just doing the best we can for for all of us who are living with Alzheimer's because it's not going to go away yet. Well, and I like that you identified the five D's, even if you don't remember them all, it, you, you acknowledge those feelings and then you push through them. Here oh. they are. Here yeah. they are. Denial at first, mm -hmm. <laughs> depressed, devastated, desperate. Mm -hmm. We were desperate. What are we going to do? And, and then um, the last one, 
I don't remember. <laughs> I only wrote down four here, but there were five. But yeah, but you know, just acknowledging, yeah, it's 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 hard. Well, if anyone is just tuning in, we are talking with the panel from the Normandale Center for Healing and Wholeness here in the Twin Cities in Minnesota. And you can find out more by visiting their site at normandalecenter.org. Or you can always email them at info at normandalecenter.org. And again, you can always call them as well, 952 929 1698. They are also on Facebook and LinkedIn as well. I am going to just give a shout out to QBlocks really quick. They are a webmaster that is phenomenal. And then we'll be right back. I also want to introduce you all to QBlocks. They have been absolutely excellent to deal with. They have been in business for 18 years and they serve the globe. I can't say enough good things about this company. I've had a lot of bad experiences. I don't know about you with tech companies. They have made a very complicated process very easy and their staff is so kind, so polite, so respectful to work with. And you know, when I am frustrated and ready to pull my hair out, they just smile and tell me everything's going to be okay. And they really are just on top of the communication, which alleviates so much stress as an owner when you're dealing with tech issues. You can get a 10% discount. Visit them at QBlocks at C U E B L O C K S dot com. Or you can email them at let's talk at qblocks.com. For that 10% discount, just put Lori, L O R I, in the inquiry form. And again, I don't think you'll be disappointed. I surely haven't been. I, I can't rave enough about this company. And that's kind of rare these days. And Becky, I want to know from you what are some top things that you can support? caregivers and their care partners? Sure. Um, you know, really when I am doing my assessment, I, I want to look at, um, it's to me, it's like a psychosocial assessment, especially as a social worker. <laughs> um, and so I want to know, you know, um, financially, are they stable or is that an issue? Um, from an emotional standpoint, how are they doing? Um, and, and also from that mental standpoint, from a spiritual standpoint, how are they doing a social standpoint? Uh, and so, and that's really both the caregiver and the care receiver. Um, and it, it's the, taking this job was a little bit of sh a shift for me, having always been more patient focused in an acute care medical setting, um, and focusing more on the caregiver. Um, so I, I always have that, um, care receiver uh, interest in mind as well. And, and it's important, but I like to look at all those aspects um, and, you know, we'll kind of evaluate where might they need um, the support more in some of those aspects than others. Um, and then input um, those services or resources. Um, some people come in with, you know, a really strong um, support network, um, and background and don't need as much um, support as others who may really be struggling, don't have family support or friend support, that type of thing. So it really is, is very individual, um, but that's why we do have our support groups. We have our memory cafe, the respite, we have uh, memory companions to also go out and help provide both the companionship to the care receiver, as well as uh, give that break to the caregiver. Um, so it, it varies person to person as to what we do, but there's so many resources out there that, and if I, you know, even as Ken was saying of looking for activities for somebody with dementia that, you know, if I don't know of a resource, I'm going to research it and do what I can to find something. Wonderful. Um, Jennifer, anything you want to add? No, just that uh, a key thing we do is that finding, you know, helping people navigate and, and. Uh, look for resources. So we're a pretty small organization. We have a handful of part-time staff with a lot of volunteers. And 
a lot of what we do is help people find other resources and supportive services in the state or that you know in the in Minnesota wherever they live um, that can help them for what they need. And our approach is kind of action planning. So, uh, what is the most immediate need in that initial conversation, and how can we address that? Maybe somebody's thinking about residential placement, or maybe someone is looking for um, you know uh, respite services or a day program. We help resource and give them multiple options to look at. So helping people, you know, uh, action item by action item along the way to kind of tackle things as they come up, as you know, things are constantly changing. And, um, and that's, that's a key approach that we have as well, just what is the most immediate need? And how can we help you address what you need to, to feel better about that? Wonderful. Yeah. Now, Leif, you, um, you've been a lifelong member, it sounds like, out there. Was it just a natural for you to slide into some of their additional support services then once you got diagnosed? Oh, very easy. And I, um, as I mentioned earlier, my husband with Parkinson's brought me into that realm. And then after he passed away and I was discovered to have the, the um, Alzheimer um set in for me i i thought i want to do what i can to make it easier for my family i want to be open about it talk about it because i have some friends who haven't been and it's been really hard to uh talk with them and make i i'd like to make them feel more comfortable and yet they just were so resistant about sharing what they had and it's so much easier when People know what you're dealing with. Uh, the empathetic uh, ability is so much easier that way, too. Oh, I totally, totally agree. Now, do you still do other programs that you did prior to your diagnosis at Normandale as well? Um, well, I have a, a group of wonderful friends that we do things with. Maybe take a little trip or um, get together for an afternoon or maybe... Uh, have dinner, share dinner together. Somebody brings one thing, someone another. So, um, and I'm the facility I'm living in, Friendship Village, is very conducive to that. They have lots of things going on. So, if you're not busy, it's my fault. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they do have a lot of stuff going on over there. That's for sure. Go ahead, Mary Margaret. I just, I'm, I'm sorry that this is. Uh, it's not a tag on tag along <laughs> it's very important to me it's the center of my being is my spiritual life and this is this is our guiding light is the spirituality that we both share and unfortunately our church is not really wanting or even willing to open their arms to learning more about Alzheimer's. Ken and I, actually, we had a different priest um, who uh, invited us to, to share our story. And there were over 50 people who came, which I thought was quite quite a uh, revelation for the Episcopalians. <laughs> Very serious. But um that went very well, but I volunteered to speak at the convention, the statewide convention, and they thanked me very much, but no thank you. So it's it's still, there's still a ways to go, and I think it, it's so important because there are so many of us, and we're, we, we're afraid to talk about it because it's so unacceptable in some circles. Mm -hmm. So I think we still have work to do. We are normal people who are living with Alzheimer's, whether we're caregivers or the person with the disease. And we want to make a difference in our world. And we do so by living as well as we can, by advocating like going to our elected officials, but we would love to be able to share with our clerical officials as well, because it is it is part of life for more and more. So, so thank you. 
out there that are becoming dementia friendly and they're actually doing special. Yes, yes, absolutely. In fact, we had a uh, support group at the Congregational Church in in uh, Minneapolis. Yes, there, yes. Yeah. Maybe I'm just talking about one denomination. Oh, I'm not sure. It really varies. I know in Roseville, um, Roseville Lutheran tried really hard, but they couldn't get people to come. But again, you have oh. to really let people know and almost do, a, I think, a kickoff program about dementia and just everything that you're doing, you know, for that. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times it, it's, again, shifting that stigma and bringing it into the norm that, you know, granted, dementia is not normal aging, but it is the norm for many families nowadays yes. that they're yes. dealing with. And so yes. we have to look at it in that light and we have to, yes. to have these conversations in order to support people. So I appreciate you you bringing that up. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing I wanted to um, ask you also, Mary Margaret, was in terms of your caring, you know, for for your husband and um, and others as well. Is there anything in particular you do to to bring to the forefront? Is that person safe, happy, and pain free? Well, that's not my number one priority. That's just a given for every day. Mm-hmm. Um, Ken is pretty pretty independent, but he's also honest. Mm-hmm. So um, we've been dealing with some AFib issues lately. And so that's been another situation where I have to be just aware of his needs at any particular moment. It could be in the middle of the night if he has an AFib attack, and that's been happening more often. But um, I I feel comfortable in our relationship. And in our communication, and I th- I feel that we're pretty honest with one another, even though he's Danish. <laughs> he did it. He can't. He can't. Half. What? Half, Half Danish. That's true. <laughs> oh dear, I'm Scandinavian too. So what can I say? <laughs> but I think I've surpassed. <laughs> Most of my my inhibitions as a Swedish Norwegian. <laughs> and is there any anything that you would like to say to you know care partners out there in terms of how you how you want to be treated, how you'd like to see things change? Well, how would we change things for other care partners, or how would how can how can things? I think I. I think it's important. I hope that as care partners, oh gosh, if we could only have every car per, care partner take our class, Becky, what is it? Powerful, <laughs> what is powerful it? tools. Powerful yes. tools. I've taken it three times. <laughs> so <laughs> that's a wonderful, wonderful class. I just recently took it with Becky. And I hadn't taken it for several years, which is another reason why I came by here, because I thought, I think it's time that I take that again, because I've been uh, a care partner for about, well, more than 15 years, because even before Ken was diagnosed, I was, we were caring for one another. So, um, yeah, I, I think... I would hope that when people get a diagnosis, it used to be that they would go into their homes, close the door, pull down the shades, and stay invisible. And I think the more we can honor ourselves, our loved ones, and the fact that this is a disease that we can live with, for as long as it is doable. Let's just take advantage of life during that period of time and love one another and be there for one another. And I think the more we open our arms, others will too. Mm 
Well, I think you are all are great examples of living graciously alongside dementia and, um, you know, walking in the light with it instead of the darkness and showing people that can still live well. Well might be defined a little differently than what it was in prior years, but that doesn't mean it's any less effective. Jennifer, anything that you want to wrap up with that we haven't covered at all? Really, I want to thank you so much for just um, providing this platform for people to share, uh, which you do so well. Your your website is just full of personal stories, and it's so rich just looking through and watching videos and all the information. It's uh, This is just fantastic to have this opportunity. As, as, as you mentioned, a lot of people don't talk about it. Um, and I was thinking about last year, Leaf had her 90th birthday and um, she talked about her dementia at the party. There were over 50 people there. And, um, you know, the bravery of, of folks who are willing to talk about um, their experience as a caregiver or someone who does have some memory loss and just put it out there. As you said, Mary Margaret, it impacts so many people's lives and to have to not talk about it is doing a disservice to others who are going through it and thinking they're alone and not not sure what to do. So I um, just want to thank thank everybody for that and, and Lori for giving us this opportunity to, to talk a little bit more today. Thank you. Well, and for Leaf and Ken, I mean, you're you're changing the stigma of what dementia looks like, you know, by being on the show, by by sharing your story with friends and family and strangers. Uh, because we, we've been fed a, a negative stigma for many, many years. You know, people, there's still a lot of people out there that think dementia is end stage, can't talk, you're in a wheelchair, you're drooling, you're in a nursing home, and it's, it's dark, dingy, and gloomy. And that is, not the, that is not the scenario for the majority of people living with dementia right now. Um, there's a lot of life to be had, and um, we never know, as, as Ken is a, a perfect example of, how it's going to progress, you know, 14 years, and they're still, like, can't figure out, what, you know, with all the biomarkers and things that he has, how he's doing so well, and it, it's like, be grateful you're doing so well, and the scientists will figure it out sooner or later, but you don't need that answer to live well today. Same with Leaf. You're living well today with dementia and you're doing that through the help of, of Becky and Jennifer and um, the Normandale Center for Healing and Wholeness and, and so many other organizations that are out there supporting you. And I think it's each and every one of our jobs to share the information that we have, share the support services that are out there, because people need more than one, typically, you know, you have to get find that right fit in that right niche. And as your journey changes, that may change. But in sharing those opportunities, we are also making it much more comfortable to have a conversation and Mm -hmm. for more people to join the conversation, which uh, to me, again, is critically important. Becky, anything else you wanted to add? Um, I, you know, I think we've covered so much. Um, it's just, it's important for, um, people to seek out that help, um, to hear this, that they're not alone. Um, and that there's such, um, great people out there living with it and they want to support each other. Um, and that's so evident in the support group. So yeah, to not be afraid to seek out that help. Um, because it really will enrich their lives. And support groups, I know I always used to look at when I was on the journey, I looked at it as one more thing I had to do for my mom. I never thought it would help me. I mean, I just, (laughs) that was not in my head. Mm -hmm. And I was so task oriented back in the time (laughs) of all my to do's. It's like, I couldn't add it. And when I got there really by mistake, going to hear a friend talk, and then he got sick and didn't show up, (laughs) I was shocked. (laughs) And I'm like, I'm coming back. I mean, I I couldn't believe how wonderful it was to find people that understood and Mm -hmm. people who weren't embarrassed of it. You know, you didn't you didn't have to you didn't have to be on guard at all with them. You know, you could just be your honest, authentic self and and learn so much and share so much. And and that's the beauty of us becoming more dementia friendly and more people stepping into this space is getting rid of the fear and bringing in the hope. So as always, you know, I want to thank our panel. um, And I also want to thank our audience for listening. And I really 
I like always encourage you to like, click and share, not because I'm chasing numbers. I, you know, I'm never going to be a Kardashian, nor do I want to be, <laughs> but I want to, I want to spread the word that there is hope. So be a giver of hope, like, click and share, get this information out to your sphere of influence. And even if you're not in Minnesota, um, there might be somebody in your sphere who is um, looking for resources in Minnesota, or maybe it's an organization, you know, on the on the other side of the world that might pick up something that they're doing here that could be duplicated there. You know, that's how we become better is is by sharing and lifting hearts. So again, take those few seconds, cost little time and no money to do. And again, you can always reach out to the Normandale uh, Center at uh, just www.normandalecenter.org or email them at info at normandalecenter.org. You can also reach them by phone at 952-929-1698. Uh, they are also on LinkedIn and Facebook. So no excuse not to, not to find them. They are out there and they're just waiting to talk to you and to support you any way you can. So thanks, everybody. Have a blessed week, and we will talk soon. Bye now. Thank you, Laurie. Thank you. Thank you.